Today we'll be going through a prelim paper. This is from St. Benedict's. This is their 2020 paper one. So we're going to start with section A. So let's just try out this question and you guys can work with me, try to do the question before I give you the answers. Okay, so let's get into it. So the first question here says that 6x squared minus 12x is equal to negative 1. Now how we find this is, first of all, rewriting it like a trinomial. So we move this negative 1 over to the other side. So we're going to have Um, we cannot factorize it using the conventional method. The best way to simplify this question would be using the quadratic formula. And this is A, this is B, and that is C. So the quadratic formula is this. So we need to substitute our values for a, b, and c into this formula over here. Now what we'll get is Then simplifying it, you'll get So the answers would be So we can leave it in two decimal places. This here says 1.91. That's what the positive value would be. And the negative answer would also be And that's it. So let's try the second question. This question here says that the root of 2x minus 1 minus 1 plus 2x is equal to 0. And we want to find x. To find x for this particular question is to solve this question, the first thing we'll do is move everything over to that side. So I'm going to move this negative 1. I'm also going to move positive 2x over to the right hand side. And this is what I'll get in return. Now, the next thing I also need to do is try to remove the square roots. To solve for x, I need to find x without the square root. And how I do that is by squaring both sides like that and the simplification here would give you 
Well, this one here, if you foil it, this is basically this. Yeah, so after foiling, you should have this. Then moving everything to the right hand side. So I can divide everything by two to simplify it a little bit. Then this can be factorized. Now factorizing, opening two brackets. This will give you two X, that's give you X. This is one, that is one. Then this is, they are both negative, yes. So my answers are X is equals to one over two or x is equals to 1. Now, unfortunately, we do not stop here. To get the actual one, because one of these two answers might be wrong, and what we'll do to be 100% sure that these answers are right is by substituting them back into the original question that we have here. Right? So I need to substitute that in. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, so anywhere I see x, I replace it with 1 over 2. So x again, replacing with 1 over 2. So as you can see here, this whole answer gives us 0. Now, now te that tells us that x is 1 over 2 is absolutely right. Yeah, So this answer is correct. But now we need to try for the second. Let's substitute 1 instead. So I'm going to replace that with 1. I'm also going to replace that with 1. Now, the problem is that this doesn't give you 0. It gives you 2. So we will say this is not applicable, or you could just say x is not equals to 1. So this is our only answer. x is equals to half. That's it. So we have this inequality question, which says x squared minus 3x minus 28 is greater than zero or greater or equals to zero. To solve this type of question, the first thing we'll do because it's a trinomial is to factorize. Factorizing you will get. Now after factorizing, we need to have critical values. Critical values is values for x if this wasn't an inequality but just equals to zero. So meaning that this here is x. Yeah, so meaning that our critical values here is x is equals to seven and x is equals to negative four. Now we need these critical values because we need to draw a number line where this would be the guest of honor, right? So in this number line, we have negative four, we have seven. Now, since this is a trinomial, a trinomial is a quadratic equation, and a quadratic equation normally produces a parabola. Okay, now, we know it's a positive parabola, by the way, because your a is actually equals to positive 1. And if your a is equals to positive 1, the parabola looks like this. So I need to draw this graph in my number line over here. Right? Just a small graph there. Okay. Now, they also tell us here that this equation is greater than zero, meaning that y is greater or equals to zero. So we are only focusing on the part that is greater or equals to zero. In our graph here, the part that is greater than or equals to zero is anything above the x line. This is our inequality line, is our x-axis line. So everything above it here is greater or equals to zero. So we we'll say that our answers are from x is less or equals to negative 4 because as you can see i shaded from negative 4 down to infinity and the other answer will be x is greater 
then seven. Greater or equals to seven. Okay, that's it for the first question. Okay, question two. Now, this is sequence and series type of question. Question two says, given the arithmetic sequence three, seven, and 11, calculate the sum of the first 20 terms. So what this question is asking us to find is S20, right? So we are trying to figure out what S20 is. Now, to figure out S20, let's talk about the formula that I use for arithmetic series. It is Sn is equals to n over 2, you have a bracket, to a plus n minus 1, d. Okay, now to get this answer, we need to know what n is, and since it's S20, we're looking for 20 terms, n is 20. We need to know what a is. a is the first term, so a is 3. And we also need to know what D is. D is T2 minus T1, T3 minus T2. They should give you the same answer. So our common difference here is 4. So all we just need to do is substitute all this into the formula, and you have your answer. Voila. So let's try this out. Okay, so I'm just going to substitute all this in my calculator. This was this going to give me? Let's see. Okay, so the answer is 820. So the sum of the first 20 terms is 820. That's it. Now the second question here says the nth term is 191. Now what that means is that Tn is equals to 191. Now since we're told in the original question that this is a arithmetic sequence, the formula for Tn is usually this okay so now we already said from the previous question that a is 3 and d is 4 we have tn and we are trying to get what n is so substituting all this into your formula this is what you get 191 is equals to 3 plus n minus 1 times 4. So this is 191 is equals to 3 plus so therefore so we can say n is equals to 192 divided by 4 what does that give you? 192 divided by 4, that's 48, okay. So the 48th term is 191. That's exactly what they wanted for this question. Nice. Now there's B. This question here says consider the series. We have 1 over 1 times 2, plus 1 over 2 times 3, plus 1 over 3 times 4, plus 1 over t, 4 times 5. Determine the following in the form of A, over b now looking at this one over here we understand that this is my t1 this is my t2 this is my t3 this is my t4 okay now since they want it in this format we can simplify each and every one of this for t1 it is 1 over 1 times 2 which is 1 over 2 that's my first term this is 2 times 3 that's 1 over 6 second term and 3 times 4 is 12, so it's 1 over 12. And finally, this one here is 1 over 20. Okay. Now, the answer is what is S2? S2 is the addition of the first term and the second term. So literally, I'm saying 1 over 2 plus 1 over 6. 
and that will give me 1 over 2 plus 1 over 6. That's 2 over 3. So we can say S2 is 2 over 3. Now for S3, S3 is T1 plus T2 plus T3. But as you know, T1 plus T2 is S2 like we have here. So literally, I can say this is the same thing as saying S2 plus T3, which as you know, will give you 2 over 3 plus the third term here is 1 over 12. Okay, so I'm taking 2 over 3. I'm adding it to 1 over 12. And that will give me 3 over 4. Okay, so S3 is 3 over 4. Then we look at S4. Now in the same vein, we could also say that this is the same thing as saying S3 plus T4, which as you know, S3 is 3 over 4. S4 is 1 over 20. Adding those two, I add this answer plus 1 over 20 is going to give 4 over 5. So we have S4 to be 4 over 5. Now, the question now says hence. Hence means continue from the previous stuff that we've done. Determine Sn. Now, we will notice a particular trend in this question. For S2, you had 2 over 3. 3, S3 was 3 over 4. S4 was 4 over 5. So we can kind of see the same value that you have connected to your S is always the numerator over there. So as you see 3 here, 3 is the numerator there. You have 4 there, 4 is the numerator over there. And the denominator is you adding the numerator plus 1. So this is the same thing as saying 2 over 2 plus 1. The same thing as saying 3 over 3 plus 1. This also is the same thing as saying 4 over 4 plus 1. So if I'm saying that for this question, I could just say this is the same thing as just saying n over n plus 1 because I have n there, so I have n in my numerator and over n plus 1. That's all. And now they said this, Tn is 1 over 1 20, 15 times 20, 16, determine Sn. So from this one here, if you go back to the top, you cannot see that for T1, we had 1 times 2. T2 is 2 times 3. T3 is 3 times 4. T4 is 4 times 5. So if this is T, Tn is 1 over 205 times 206, we understand that this will come from T205. Right, and if you are getting the value for t, if you are getting the sum for this, which would be the s of two hundred fifteen, which means that your final answer will just be two twenty fifteen over twenty sixteen. As you know, that's the formula there: n over n plus one. That's it. C. Now this question says find the value for a in the following. We have a sigma. There is an infinity on top of the sigma in the denominator here, or not the denominator, um, the stuff below the sigma. You see this r is equals to zero. And the equation of our sigma is a over 4r. Now, one thing that you need to always know is that this is your sigma, right? Everything, this whole thing is the sum, right? This whole thing over here, we call it the sum. Now, this equals to sign is the evaluation of our sigma. So this whole sigma gives me 16. Now, since we are trying to find the sum, not just any sum, the sum of infinity, we understand that S infinity is equal to 16. That's what this tells me. Okay. Now, if you're finding sum of infinity, the formula for to get sum to infinity is A over 1 minus R. We need to figure out what A is. We need to figure out what R is so that we can get our values for sum to infinity. Okay, now to determine A and R, we do that by getting our first three terms. And how we get our first three terms is substituting, right? We would have to break down this, our sigma notation by substituting R, you see this R over here? Substituting into the equation. So I'm putting R as zero, R as one, and R as two, right? So I'm saying A, which as you know, this is A, A, 
this, which is just a over four, and we have a this. So we just got three terms, yeah? So from here, we understand that our a is equals to a, because that's our first term. Our first term is a, and we just say it's a, and to get our r, we divide our second term divided by first term, our third term divided by our second term. And the answer you get when you do the simplification will just be 1 over 4. So all we just now need to do is substitute this into the sum to infinity formula. Now, sum to infinity is 16. And this here is equals to a is a over, we have 1 minus 1 over 4. Okay. So simplifying this a bit, this here will give you 16 times 3 over 4 is equals to a. So therefore, a is equals to 12. Yeah. Did you want us to just get a? Yeah, there we go. So the answer that we have here is a is equals to 12. That's all we needed to do. And that is it. Okay, to question three, the financial maths. This question says, Anna wants to buy a house in 10 years' time. Currently, the value of the house she's looking at is 800,000 rands. The first question says, Anna is informed that the property grows at an average rate of 8% per annum. What will be the cost of the house in 10 years' time? So to calculate this, we are going to use compound interest, right? So this is just the basic compound interest, which is A is equals to P, 1 plus I, to the N. So we just need to substitute. Um, our P is the principal, the original amount. It is 800,000. Sarah, Sarah, there we go. The interest rate is 0, 0,08, and it's going to be for 10 years. So therefore, our accumulated amount after 10 years would be, so let's put it in our calculator. So we're looking at, okay, so the answer would be one, seven, Two seven one three, two seven one three, nine comma nine comma nine nine eight. So which can just be approximated into one seven two seven one forty rand. Okay. So the house is going to be what a million seven hundred and twenty seven thousand one hundred and forty rands in ten years time, an eight hundred thousand house. Yeah, so this information is quite important because we're going to need it in the next question. Now, the next question here says, Anna deposits 10000 into a savings account. One month later, she deposits a further 10000 in the account, and she continues to do so for 10 years. The interest is 6% per annum compounded monthly. Will she be able to buy the house at the end of the 10-year period? So with this type of question, we use future value to help us find our answers, right? So the formula for future value is this. Okay, so we're using future value because we are dealing with savings account, right? A consistent savings, we always use future value. Now, we need to know what X is. X represents the deposits, and since you're depositing 10,000, that's your X. We have our I, is the interest rate. The interest rate is going to be 0, 0,06, right? Now, because it is compounded monthly, we also need to divide this value by 12, and we also have our N. Now, N is the amount of payments that's going to be made over this 10 years. Now, since it's 10 years, we understand it to be 10 times 12. However, because it also tells us that Anna deposits into this savings account immediately, 
right? Not one month later. We need to add that extra deposit. That's why we're adding plus one. So our N is actually going to be 121 instead of 120. Now, all we just now need to do is substitute each and every one of these values, and you're going to get... Okay, so we can just put all this in the calculator. You need to be a little bit careful. Let's see. Okay, let's put this first. I think I'm missing a bracket. Yeah, there should be a bracket here. There we go. And another bracket here. That's it. Okay, so the answer here is 1.6 million. So it's 1656987. 1656987. And in decimal places, converting to four des two decimal places, this is just going to be 4.4. Four. Okay. So this is the amount of money that you would have saved over the 10-year period. Now, in the previous question, we say that the house is going to be what? 1.7 million. And in 10 years' time, by saving 10,000 every month for 10 years, she would have saved 1.6 million. And the question was, will she be able to buy the house at the end of the 10-year period? The answer would be a resounding no, right? She wouldn't. Yeah, because she, she doesn't have enough money. Okay. And question C says, after how many months will Anna Savings account balance exceed 1 million for the first time okay so to answer this question here we would take our future value to be a million so we want to find the exact month it's going to cross this a million mark right so using the same future value formula we're going to substitute but now remember we're trying to find n everything's the same the only difference now is that we are trying to find how many months? The n, the n value, right? So this one here would represent Okay, so the first thing we'll do is we are going to simplify. So we'll cross multiply and also divide by 10,000. So a million, so how many zeros is that? One, two, three, four, five, six. There we go. We multiply it by. And we divide the answer by 10,000. So that will give you 1 over 2. So we're going to have 1. Okay, moving the 1 over to the other side. This will give you 3 over 2 is equals to.
So to find n, since n is a power, we have to rewrite this in terms of logs, right? So we're going to change this exponent in logs. So this will give you that there's 3 over 2. Okay, so putting this all in your calculator, this is what it's going to get. And this one here is 3 of 2. Now this here gives you 81,295, right? 81,295. Okay, so next you have to round up to whole numbers. Since it can be decimals, this here will be 82 payments, right? Uh, after the 82nd payment, you would exceed a million rand. Yeah, but in the question, we were also told that this person started the started saving immediately, not one month after. So for that reason, is actually just going to take 81 months because the first month she kind of paid two payments she paid one at the beginning of the month and the other one at the end of the month right so that's exactly how we're going to look at it so we have this as 81 months and that's will be your answer so let's get into question four now we're going to also step into calculus this is first principle this question says if fx is equals to 2 minus 2x squared determine f prime x from first principle now for you to use first principle the first thing you need to do is figure out what f x plus h is so literally i'm replacing x with x plus h so i'm writing then simplifying this you'll get Now that we have our x plus h, we can now find our derivative. So the formula for first principle is and we also have the limit h tends to zero. We just need to substitute this, you will get. So now simplifying it, 2 minus 2 is 0, negative 2x squared plus 2x squared is also 0. So what I'm left with is this. And all we just need to do for this is we bring out an h. And you're just left with it. 
Then we use the limit. It will just be negative 4x. And this will be your final answer. That's it. So B says determine, right? We also need to leave our answers in positive exponents. So to answer this, the first thing you will do is split the division sign. So this will give you Simplifying it a little bit, you will get Okay, so this is the best simplification that we can work with whenever you are simplifying you need to try as much as possible to make sure It kind of looks like this you having a coefficient having x and one power. You should always have these three things. Then you can know that you can differentiate it, right? So we've simplified it to kind of look like that. So with this now, differentiating this, this will give you and a quick refresher cost on differentiation. If you want to differentiate something like this, would say it is a times n x n minus 1. We multiply the power by the coefficient and the power we subtract 1, right? So this negative half times 1 here which gives you negative half and negative half minus 1 gives you negative 3 over 2. The same thing kind of happens here also. And with this you would have Now, since they wanted our answers in positive exponents, we can leave it like this. So this question here wants us to determine dy over dx. If y is equal to 8x cubed minus 125 over 2x minus 5. To answer this, we can factorize. So we're going to factorize the numerator. Now, this numerator here is literally the same thing as saying right so it's to help you factorize this a little bit so the factorization of this would give you If you're not 100% sure of how I got this, I made a video on cubic factorization. You can check it out in the descriptions on the calculus playlist. It will definitely help you out. Okay? So that's what you have as your numerator. Now this whole thing over 2x minus 5. And as you can see, this can cancel that out. So all you'll be left with, so by the way, this is y. Yeah, so all you'll be left with for y is 4x squared plus 10x plus 25. Now to get a derivative, which is dy dx, this here would be 8x plus 10. And that's it. Moving on to question 5. The question 5 says the graph of f of x is equals to 2 to the power of negative x is sketched below. So this is the sketch of 2 to the negative x. Now it asks you 
The first question here asks you to determine the equation of the inverse. Inverse is the transformation of x and y into y and x. So what I'm doing is anywhere I see x, I replace it with y. Anywhere I see y, I replace it with x. That's the concept of inverse. So we're asked to determine the equation of the inverse of f in the form of f to the power of negative 1, x. So to determine the equation of the inverse, we write our equation first of all. Which, as you know, can be written as this. x and y changes places. So to get our answer, we need to write this equation in log form. Because that's the only way to find our value for y. So this here can be written as y is equal to the log of half x. We could also say, since that's what I wanted, this is the log of half x. That's the answer. That's it. So B. B says draw the graph of the inverse on the set of axes, clearly showing all the intercepts with this axis. From the original question, the y-intercept is equal to 1. We know this because when you substitute this, it gives you 1 for y. So if our y-intercept here is 1, it would mean that our x-intercept for the inverse would be 1. Since as you know, y and x change places. And from there, we can also draw our graph. And the graph here would look like this, more or less. And that's it. The next question tells us to find the range of the inverse, right? So looking at our inverse graph, this is our inverse graph. To find our range, we need to figure out all the possible values for y. Now, since our graph is starting from positive infinity, we know that because it's moving in that direction. And from this arrow here, we see that it's also going to go down to negative infinity. That would be the range of this graph. So writing that down, so is y is an element of negative infinity to infinity. Or you could also say y is an element of real numbers. Any of those are absolutely right. Now d says calculate the value of x if fx is greater than 8. Now the question tells us that f of x is equal to 2 to the negative x. So we replacing f of x with 2 to the negative x. We can say that that is greater than 8. Then simplifying this, but we have to use logs, is x is greater than the log of 2 to the 8. Okay? So now substituting this in our calculator, we can say is the log of 2 to the 8. That gives you 3. So we know that negative x is greater than 3. But since we want x, because that's what the question asks, the values of x, not negative x, we can say x is less than negative 3. That would be your answers. Question 6. This here says a group of 200 people were asked about the kind of sport they watch on TV. 180 people watch rugby, cricket, or soccer. The information was collected and represented in a Venn diagram where R represents rugby, S represents soccer, and C represents cricket. So as you can see, this is our Venn diagram. The total sample of our Venn diagram is 200. Um, we have 20 people which are outliers. These are guys that do not watch soccer, rugby, or cricket because that's why you see 20 over here. Okay, so let's get into the question. The question, the first question here says, how many people watch rugby or cricket? So now if you're trying to figure out the amount of people that watch rugby or cricket, is everyone in the circle where you have rugby or cricket? So basically, if I'm going to shade this, let's say I shade it looking like this. Yeah. So here, as you can see, even though included some people in soccer, 
but those guys that are in soccer also watch rugby or cricket so now with this we just have to add the numbers inside those two circles okay so let's try let's add them we have 50 plus 20 plus 30 plus 5 plus 25 plus 10 140 okay so it means that the first one over here our answer is just 140 people okay let's clean that off now b says determine the probability of r or s or c prime now this prime that you have over here cannot represent not okay let me give you a quick example so the probability the probability of not a is equals to 1 minus the probability of a okay so the probability of something not happening is equals to the probability of 1 minus the thing actually happening okay so to get this one here we're looking at what is not in r or s or c so it is outside those circles is me actually shading this part everything outside those circles right so as you can see this is kind of like a rough sketch bear with me you can see that the part i'm actually shading the only value there is this 20 that you have here so since the total people we're working with was 200 they said a group of 200 people we understand the probability of this will just be 20 over 200 which is One over 10, we could also make it 0, 0,1. Okay. Then for C, it says determine whether watching cricket and rugby are independent events. So to prove two events are independent, we actually say that the probability of cricket times the probability of rugby has to give you the probability of cricket and rugby. Now, if this statement is true, then it is an independent event but if it is not true then we can say it's definitely not an independent event okay so now let's go back up and look at the probability of cricket rugby and cricket and rugby okay in this all. so with cricket we're looking at everything in the cricket circle right which is literally that So therefore, this would be so that's sixty five. Everything in the rugby circle, looking at that. So we want 50 plus 20 plus 5 plus 25, 100, okay. So this one here would be 100. And finally, in the rugby and cricket intersection, we're actually looking at this part here. Okay, and that there is just 20 plus 5, as you know, is 25. Okay, so those are the values. Now, we need to write all this in terms of probability. So, for cricket, we know that is 65. Okay, so this here would be 65. Now, since it is, since we're working with a total group of people of 200, so that's 100 over 200 and we need this to be equals to 25 over 200 okay so putting this in our calculator okay 
Okay, this is 13 over 80, which is also 0, 0,1625. 0, 0,1625. And on this side, we do the same thing. We have 25 over 200 times 1 over 8, which is 1 over 8, which is 0, 0,125. Now, as you can see here, they are not equal, right? The fractions are not equal. The decimals are not equal. So we would say that this is not an independent event, right? That's it. Question seven. So we have this function, which is 2x cubed minus 5x squared plus 8x plus 18, where a is a constant. Given that x minus 3 is a factor of f, show that a is equal to negative 9. What this means when you're told that x minus 3 is a factor, it means that if you substitute x equals to 3 into this f of x, you would get 0. So all we just need to do is substitute 3. That's it. So we're going to substitute 3 in this. This is what we're going to get. Yeah, so we know this is 0, and that will be... That's 27, so we have 3a plus 27, so therefore a will be negative 9, which is exactly what they wanted over here. That's it. Now in 2, it tells us to factorize completely. Now our equation is now going to look like this. f of x is equals to 2x3 minus 5x squared, then now we have this, negative 9, x plus 18. Now the question was nice enough to tell us one of the factors, so we don't really need to substitute. So we already have x minus 3 is definitely a factor. Now if you're not 100% sure how to factorize properly, you could also check out the calculus playlist on how to factorize cubic polynomials that will definitely help you out a bit. But a uh, rough idea of what to do is first of all, you find a factor. After finding a factor, you would draw a second bracket, a bigger bracket, which would take in your quadratic equation. Now, the value we have here, when you multiply it with the value you have here, it should give you 2x cubed. So x times 2x squared gives you 2x cubed. And also the value we have here for our c, when you multiply this negative 3 times it, it gives you plus 18. So this here has to be negative 6. Now to get the bigger value, we need to focus on this value and the multiplication of those two values, right? So we just need the constants from there. Now the, co the coefficient from this or the constant from here is negative 5. So we'll say it's negative 5 is equal to when you multiply this here. This gives you negative 6, so this is also negative 6. Now we need a value that you add to negative 6 that gives you negative 5, and that happens to be 1. So we can say this here will be plus 1x, okay? So factorizing this a little bit again, this will be negative 3. This can be factorized into 2x minus 3 and x plus 2. Yes, okay, that's it. So you we have completely factorized this polynomial. Now three says given that gy is equals to this, right? I don't want to say all this. Find the values of x that satisfies g to the y is equals to zero. Okay, so I think there is a mistake. This here should actually be the values of y, to find the values of y. 
to satisfy g to the y is equals to zero. Now, one thing that we'll kind of notice in this is that this is the exact same equation as that. The only difference is that x has been replaced with this value that you see over there. Okay? So if you think about it, I'm going to rewrite it one more time. This here is the same thing I'm saying 2 to the 3y, three, 3 minus 5 to the 3y, 2 minus 9 to the 3y plus 18. Yeah, so you can see that if you actually put x there, it looks like exactly like the formula that we're working with. Okay. So now, in the previous question already, we already factorized what this would give you, right? So now think about that, let's say this question here had equals to zero, what would be your answer? The answer for this would have been x is equals to 3, x is equals to 3 over 2, and x is equals to negative 2, right? So we are just going to replace this with 3y, every single thing you have there. So we are saying that 3 to the y is equals to 3, we have 3 to the y is equals to 3 over 2. And we also have 3 to the y is equals to negative 2, right? So solving them independently, this here is just 3 to the y is equals to 3 to the 1. So therefore, y is equals to 1. And this one here, we have to use logs. So y is equals to the log of 3, 3 over 2. Let's put this in our calculator. Log, not that log. Ooh. This log, there we go. 3, 3 over 2, as you can see, is 0, 0,68. So 0, 0, 0,37. 0, 0,37. So y is equal to 0, 0,37. They wanted in two decimal places, I think. Yeah, two decimal places. 0, 0,37. Is that right? Yeah, that is. 0, 0,37. Okay. Then finally, for this one over here, you have y is equals to the log of 3, negative 2. And if you try that out, so now we have this here as negative 2. So that's, you have no solution, right? So this has no solution. So there's no answer for that. Okay. So these are our only two answers. y equals to 1 and y is equals to 0, 37. And that's it. So now B now says prove that this equation has no real roots, okay? So to get this, let's try as much as possible to cross multiply, simplify it, try to find x and see what will happen. So the cross, cross multiplication here would, would give you two open bracket x plus four plus one. And this one here is x to the four. Then multiplying it out, so we have x to the four plus 2 is equals to x to the 4. We move it over, we get 2 to the x plus 4 minus x to the 4 is equals to negative 2. So this is x to the 4 is equals to negative 2. So here we give you x is equals to the fourth root of negative 2. And now this answer here would have no solution. And if it has no solution, it definitely has no real roots. And that's your answer. That's exactly how you prove it. And we're done. Yeah, and that's it. Okay, so that's it for the first section. That's section A. And in the next section, we'll be talking about section B. Now, do not forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Bye.